Hello, I thought I'd share with you a selection of poetry today um, to help alleviate the boredom that some people may be feeling as they're locked in, or locked down, whichever. Um, I'll put up links in the uh, blog page for the various books in case anybody wants to go and track down some of the books, or at least track down the individual uh, poets, if not necessarily the whole collection. Um, so this is in no especially logical order. The last poem I'll finish on is one of my own, but I'll take you through, through a few others that interest me. So this first poem is by a poet called Nicholas McLachlan, and the poem itself is called Seed Saver. Um, I got this in a book called Coom, which is an anthology of new writing from Kerry. There we go. And so I'll put the link up for that in the, well, I'll say the link, the, um, the title up for that in the um, spiel on my uh, blog page that goes with this. So, Seed Saver. Blayen, this early comer, bringer of new stories, seed saver for old, easy on the soil, ranked and titled, honoured above the rest. Not the island's first blowing, nor its last, but for all that, he might have been a time traveller, backtracking through time, crossing the sound, breaching his craft on sheet metal sand, bronze age man pitying his Neolithic predecessor. Instead, spanning two worlds, he split the seed case of that oral tradition and, season after season, broadcast its essence, enabling new scribes' record germinate on damp parchment. The names of sea caves, the lives of the drowned, the precise location of oat fields in a heady mixture of the half forgotten and the half remembered. I particularly like that one. Um, it kind of combines my uh, interest in, in Celtic poetry in general and nature poetry um, with, with, a, with a whiff, a hint of time lords about it and time travel. So a, a little bit of both of my um, weird obsessions there. Now this um, next poem is from a book that was given to me as a 21st birthday present, though it's rather older than my 21st birthday. Um, the poet is called Charles Williams and the book is called The Region of the Summer Stars. So it's a rather um, well-worn book. It was from a second-hand bookshop. Um, it's a, a collection of poems all around um, King Arthur and Merlin and the Knights of the Round Table and so on. Um, the poems are very, very long and I'm not going to read you the whole thing because it would take an age. But I'll, I'll read you a section, the first couple of um, hefty verses, from a, uh, a chapter, I think that's probably a better way of describing it than a poem because it's so long, called The Calling of Taliesin. And for anyone <coughs> oh, excuse me, unfamiliar, Taliesin is perhaps the most famous of the probably mythical but possibly real Welsh bards of ancient times. A, a sort of a forerunner of Merlin in many ways. So, the calling of Taliesin. By some it was said that Taliesin was a child of Chenug the Saint, bred in Carleon and thence come miracle commissioned by some that he sprang from the bards, the ancient guards of the cauldron called of Caridwen, she goddess or priestess. Tied Voel's wife, whose life was legend, and he, if her son by then, so by magic. None knew, no clue he showed when he rode down the Y, coracle cradled and at the weir was seen by Elfin, the son of Gwythnum, and drawn to shore the men with Elfin then could only stare at the bright forehead of the lonely river fugitive, the child coming from the wild druid wood. Could they believe in the light that lived from his brow, Decision there as here was the mind's election, the arbitration of faith, the erection of the city. But Elfin was a man of the tribes, his vocation the bloods, nor could feel in more than a chorus after a meal verse. Vainly Taliesin's first song, though river matted rhythms, while he smiled at the sky pulsated, 
Only in the song of a current code showed the child already initiated, in the changes of the cauldron of Keridwen from the fish to the frog, from the frog to the crow, from the crow to the leaping row, from the row to the kindled fire, from fire to wheat, from wheat to the cooked loaf, from shapes that eat to shapes that are eaten, and then to the fish split, to be at once on the dish and again in the sea, the fated cycle communicated in heathen secrets, for the Lord God had not yet set him at liberty nor shown him the doctrine of largesse in the land of the Trinity. In Elfin's house he grew and practised verse, striving in his young body with the double living of the breath in the lung and the sung breath in the brain, the growing and the knowing and the union of both in the showing, the triune union in each line of verse, but lacking the formulae and the grand backing of the empire. Yet then... His heart, ears, and eyes were wise from druid secrets. In the twilight and the sun dawn, his hearing caught each smallest singular cry of bird and beast. Almost he talked their talk, his sight followed each furthest flight, each small insect dance pattern in the air. He knew correspondence and the law of similitudes. He had been the court, seen the cauldron of poetry and plenty. He heard now dimly of the food that freed from the cycle, of the butterflies of the monks and the baps and the beans of hermits in Thule and the Thibad. When Elfin asked him his lineage, he sang, riddling, My heritage is all men's, only my age is my own. I am a wonder whose origin is not known. I carried in battle a banner before Cleon of Lochlan, and held in the sleeping chamber a mirror for his queen. I am more than the visions of all men and my own vision, and my true region is the summer stars. I suffered in dreams derision for the song of a virgin. Yet I stood in the galaxy at the throne of the distributor and flew over the waves when the world was in flood. I rose to the third heaven with her of the penitence and was tangled through every sense by the hazel bush. I was mangled for a night and a day by black swine. Yet my true region is the summer stars. I was thrall to Keridwen, and free in the manger of an ass. Before speech came to pass, I was full of the danger of loquacity. It is a doubt if my body is flesh or fish. Therefore no woman will ever wish to bed me, and no man make true love without me. All the doctors come to stand about me, yet I shall never have any near me to need me. Every king shall call me Taliesin, and to the doom I am handfast with all the dead. Which is very reminiscent of a lot of medieval uh, Welsh meter of, of the invocations and the patterns and formations of different, um, uh, the, the poet calling upon and declaiming himself to be part of nature, of animals and beasts and birds and the ocean wave and so forth, that they're, they're turning in and out. And again, a lot of medieval poetry blends in um, the, the Christian and the pagan all together, one into the other. So I think um, Williams does particularly well on there. Now these these are two more from Williams, um, a wider collection called the Arthurian Poems of Charles Williams, um, which is split into two books. The first of which is where, where these next two poems come from, is Taliesin through Logas, and that's the book. Again, a, a somewhat old book you can see. So. Um, Two, two sections of poetry here, and you'll get why I'm, I'm reading them, because of all the Druid references as we go along. Taliesin's return to Lucas. The seas were left behind in a harbour of Lucas. Lightly I came to land, under a roaring wind. Strained were the golden sails, the masts of the galley creaked, as it rode for the golden horn, and I for the hill of Wales. 
In a train of golden cars, the emperor went above, for over me in my riding shot seven golden stars, as if while the great oak stood straining, creaking around seven times the golden sickle flashed in the druid wood. Covered on my back, untouched, my harp had hung. Its notes sprang to sound as I took the blindfold track, the road that runs from tales to the darkness where CSA's son sings to the truants of towns in a forest of nightingales. The beast ran in the wood that had lost the man's mind. On a path harder than death, spectral shapes stood. Propped against trees, they gazed as I rode by. Fast after me pour the light of flooding seas. But I was druid sprung. I cast my heart in the way. All the mercy I called to give courage to my tongue as I come by Brosseliand. A diagram played in the night where either the golden sickle flashed or a signalling hand. Away on the southern seas was the creaking of the mast. Beyond the Roman road was the creaking of the trees. Beyond the farms and the fallows, the sickle of a golden arm that gathered fate in the forest. In a stretched palm caught the hallows. At the falling of the first chaos behind me checked, at the falling of the second the wood showed the worst. At the falling of the third I had come to the king's camp, the harp on my back syllabled the signal word. I saw a druid light burn through the druid hills, as the hooves of King Arthur's horse rode rounded me in the night. I heard the running of the flame faster than fast through logas into the camp by the hazels, I, Talgazin, come which is full of um, all sorts of Arthurian imagery. Um, Brasiliand is one of the forests in Arthur's story, um, full of magic and mystery and, and dragons and knights and adventure. Um, this second section is called, or subtitled, The Calling of Arthur, and is all about the um, relationship between Merlin the wizard and the very young King Arthur, when he is still sort of summoned to um, Merlin's tutelage. So the calling of Arthur. Arthur was young. Merlin met him on the road. Wolfish the wizard stared, coming from the wild, black with hair, bleak with hunger, defiled from a bed in the dung of cattle. Inhuman, his eyes. Bald stood Arthur. The snow beat, Merlin spoke. Now am I Camelot, now am I to be builded. King Cradlemass sits by Thames, a mask er gilded covers his wrinkled face, all but one eye. Cold and small, he settles his rump in the cushions. Through the emerald of Nero, one short-sighted eye peers at the peddlers of wealth that stand plausibly by. The bleak mask is gilded with a maiden's motionless smile. The high, aged voice squeals with callous comfort. He sits on the bank of the Thames, a sea snail's shell fragile, fragilely cast, cast out by the swell onto the mud. His spirit withers and dies. He withers, he peers at the tide, he squeals, he warms himself by the fire and eats his food through a maiden's motionless mouth. In his mood, he polishes his emerald misty with tears for the poor. The waste of snow covers the waste of thorn. On the waste of hovels, snow falls from a dreary sky. Mallet and scythe are silent. The children die. King Cradlemus fears that the winter is hard for the poor. Draw now the tide, spring moon, swing now the depth under the snow that falls over brick and prickle, the people ebb, draw up the hammer and the sickle, the banner of Bors is abroad. Where is the king? Bors is up, his wife Elaine behind him. Mends the farms, gets food from Gaul. The south is up with hammer and sickle and holds Ten's mouth. Lancelot hastens, coming with wagons and ships. The sea snail lies by Thames. 
Oh, wave of Pendragon, roll it, swallow it. Pull the mask er gilded from the one-eyed face that blinks at the comfort builded in London's ruins. I am Camelot. Arthur, raise me. Arthur ran. The people marched in the snow. King Cradlemus died in his litter. A screaming few fled. Merlin came. Camelot grew. In Logos, the king's friend landed. Lancelot of Gaul. Which is all about, obviously, the building of Camelot. Um, inspired by the visions of Merlin to replace the uh, well, corrupt and useless King Cradlemus who was there beforehand. And it does seem strangely um, pertinent, perhaps, to times we're in, talking about um, the poor dying and, and being kind of written off by the incompetent king. Not that I wish to draw any political analogies to current situations whatsoever. And these days, not so much a king, but there we go. Okay, that's putting Arthurian poems to one side. Two more poems to go, you'll be relieved here before it's all over. Uh, this one is by a poet called Chase Twitchell, um, American poet. And the book collection is called Dog Language, which is why I bought it. There we go, Dog Language. And the fact that there's dog paws on the cover appealed to me. Um, turns out not to be quite as much about dogs as I initially thought, but there we go. Um, I've not read any other poems by uh, Twitchell, so this is... Oh, books of poetry by Twitchell, so just the poems in this particular book. So I'll, I'll give you this one, and um, might inspire some of you to go out and buy his other works, or buy this, a copy of this one. Cities of Mind. From up here on the parapets, I can see skeletons of meaning strewn among stones, all the way east to childhood's shaded rooms, to the west lie the cities, I have not yet imagined and those I never will. Let's admit it's an addiction, this scribbling turned typing. How else might we speak of it as an anxiety? In any case, I seem to like its fangs in my heart. On Dad's 80th birthday, we had a little party in the living room, the whole herd of wheelchairs drawn like magnets to the smell of cake, the snuffed out candles. I'm sorry my father keeps barging in here. He doesn't usually stay very long. He's an old man who once uh, was once a man, and one of Mum's shadows falls from time to time, just so you know. Jim Richardson says, all work is the avoidance of harder work. True, in my case. When the carpenters started on the porch, I moved the computer to the guest room, where I had to crawl under the bed with an extension cord to get juice. Then I had to fight hedges of cast-offs, wrapping papers and ribbons, a ser plastic serpent's nest of strapping tape unwillingly to stay in the waste basket. The snake's name something like anaconda, boa constrictor, python, rattler. Oh, I know. Time consumer. Confetti, glitter, glamour, the frosting flowers and the hopeless little figurines glued to the cake. What happens to those? Do people save them, pass them down the generations? When Nan got into the coyote bait, I drove her through the wee hours to the fancy animal hospital far away, thinking, let her live, let her not suffer. Then, let her die quickly, thus killing the snake of my fear, along with the dog. See what happens if you leave the blossoms on the tree. They go on blooming, obscuring the thorns, and before you know it, a scarf of identity has distracted you, a jewel of history glinted in your eye. Raised on the classic myths, I see the drift nets of latitude and longitude on the night sky, inhabited by beasts and gods. On Pegasus I fled the hunter, the centaur, the satyr, riding the star horse out to free the great and lesser bears, the major and minor dogs, caged in their constellations. I like that one, partly because um, it's all about the process of writing and how um, the, the author Chase, as a writer, is constantly and easily distracted by all sorts of other things going on around at the time, and I can identify with that. It's very easy, very hard, rather, to have the discipline to sit and write and write and write and not get distracted by 101 other things going on. Um, several of the poems in the book deal with the, the father growing old and getting iller and iller and eventually dying. So the, sort of the, the poems have a, 
an almost diary-like quality that they chart events in the poet's life and in the life of the poet's family as they go on. And I also like the references to classic mythology and the constellations at the end. Um, you know, the sort of the interfusing not only of the land and mythology and magic, but also the interfusing of the sky with mythology and magic. Um, I've written poems myself about the, the, the magical landscape, more so than I don't think I've ever written one about a magical skyscape, but maybe it's time I did. Um, to finish with, um, this is a poem which I, I wrote from one of my books, Bard Song. Um, this particular one is in Welsh meter, the, the, if anyone's unfamiliar with the book. Um, all of the poetry is in various traditional forms of meter, some Welsh, some Irish, some um, Scandinavian meters, Greek, Roman meters, and so on. Um, sort of uh, the, the, the meters of ancient pagan cultures, basically. Um, this particular Welsh meter is called Barra Tethaith, um, which if you want to know how to write in that metrical style, you could always buy this book or go online. Actually, there are websites that will tell you how to do it if you want to save the money. It would be nice if you did buy the book. <laughs> so the poem is called Before the Owl Takes Flight. And it's a poem inspired by Welsh mythology and the story of Blodaibeth, the flower maiden, who um, is created out of flowers to be a wife for Llai, one of the Welsh gods. Um, but she, she rebels against that and she goes off with a different man of her choice. And then it all ends rather tragically. That man gets killed um, in an act of revenge, largely because they've not simply run off. They've also conspired to murder Blodaibeth's husband in order to free her up to marry this other man. So it's not just a case of adultery, it's attempted murder as well. Um, and finally, not only is the, the other man killed off, but Blodaiweth herself is transformed from a flower maid and a creature of the sun of the daylight, um, turning towards the light as flowers tend to do, uh, or some flowers do anyway. Um, but she's turned into an owl. That's part of her punishment to become a creature of the dark rather than a creature of the daylight. And so this this story um, poem rather is inspired by that. Um, and was uh, one of the early ones I wrote in Welsh meter. So there we go. Before the owl takes flight. Let your sap rise up in greeting of the tender light so fleeting. Bright the blossoms of the broom, sweet fresh joy, golden boy, future groom. Old Marth's words the earth does waken, flowers from their slumber shaken. Winter's brittle tomb cracks with painful sigh, butterfly starts her reign. Time does youth its bright colours fleece, from the gods we our rainbow lease. Unfurl your petals whilst the sky can see such beauty, be not shy. Decaying winter exorcise with rich perfumes and lovers' sighs. Nodding heads of flowers beat life's rhythm, with them languid bees meet. Honeyed love blooms beneath the sun, yet wilts without its chosen one. Growing free, she is savoured best of all, what fool plucks her in jest? When the light is gone, what remains? Bloodless, spectral white, shadow stains the bower, through which the ghostly owl sails, wails in the night, pale host. Cavort with her whilst she is here, treasure blossoms like jewels dear. When all is grey and the white owl swoops low, know that the dawn brings light. Um, which is partly a celebration of spring and a reminder that nothing lasts, so make the most of it whilst you can. Um, I'll put the links up for the various books on the blog, as I've said, and if you like those poems, you can chase them up, chase the poets up, find that those work, works, and find any other um, books of poetry and what have you that they've written.